welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. Gross. I had my car serviced the other week and the mechanic found a huge pack rat nest in my engine. It's no coincidence that I also found pack rat poop in my horse's feed buckets that same morning. So Mr. and Mrs. Pack Rat have inspired this episode, Claire. Today we're talking about hay and feed storage, which go hand in hand with rodent control in our barns. They certainly do. And I'm so sorry about your car engine. That's gross. <laughs> It is. And it's gross that they're hanging out in my horse feed too. Well, not in the feed, but in my buckets. Let's start with why is it so important how you store your horse's hay and feed and how you can protect it from things like rodents. Yeah, it is important. And I think most of us understand conceptually that rodents carry a range of diseases. And obviously, if you have things that die in your feed there is a real potential for some diseases such as botulism. I think we've all unfortunately heard on various social media channels, horse news channels or whatever, of unfortunate cases of horses that have eaten some kind of feed that's had some kind of dead animal critter in it that has then resulted in a case of botulism, which is most of the time fatal for horses. So that's the big one. And then obviously our feed costs a lot of money. And when you have things living in your feed, eating your feed, you don't buy nice, expensive horse feed to feed rats. Rats with very shiny coats. Yes, coat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they just make a mess, even if it didn't have any potential negative consequence to you. And there are health implications to people. They carry diseases in their urine and things that can be transmitted to people. That's why I kind of get grossed out as well. It's like, you know, handles of feed scoops and bucket handles. And let's be honest, we're all picking things up at the barn and touching our faces and what have you all day long. So there's that component as well. So yeah, I do think feed storage, how you store your feed is important for a number of reasons. Yeah. And so you mentioned botulism. And I think it's really fascinating that it takes less botulism toxin to kill a horse than it does to kill a mouse. That fact has always been just really crazy to me. That's how sensitive horses are to botulism. That is unrelated to the reason why horses can get botulism because mice or rats are dead in their hay. It's not that the mouse gets botulism and then transfers it. Right. We won't confuse that point. But botulism does come from critters that are dead, usually in large hay bales. It's usually seen as a risk for horses that eat from big round bales. So I think it's important to point that out to people too. If you're somebody that uses big round bales, I think it's definitely worth having a conversation with your vet as to whether or not your horse is a good candidate for there is a vaccine out there against botulism. And generally, big round bale feeding is one of the few times we really tend to use that. Obviously, the rest of the time, it's sort of hopefully low risk and there's not a lot of reason to vaccinate against botulism. But if you are feeding large round bales, it is worth having a conversation with your vet. So besides critters getting in, our feed. Another really important reason to think about how we store it is that horses who get out that are clever, you know, open up their gates and escape and get into feed are at a real risk for laminitis if they overeat. Can you explain that to us? 
why that happens. Especially if they get into things that are higher in starch or maybe relatively low in starch, but because they eat a huge volume of it, then obviously their total grams of starch sugar intake can be quite high in that one meal. The biggest reason for that is we worry about hind gut disruption when they eat a large amount of feed that is not part of their normal diet, the microbes in the hindgut can become very upset with that. And you can actually get some diet bacterial die off. And when those hindgut bacteria die, they can release toxins that then end up in the bloodstream and can cause laminitis that way. And that's not the laminitis we think of. Most horses that are getting laminitis are, I love this word, endocrinopathic cases of laminitis, which I'm is... I'm glad you said it and I didn't. <laughs> hormone related, <laughs> right? So the majority of laminitis cases are horses that have dysregulated insulin and have elevated insulin most of the time and then eat diets that are too high in starch and sugar and that causes laminitis. That's the most common mechanism for laminitis. So this hindgut disruption, so toxicity mechanism is different. Obviously, you know, if you have a horse, and let's be honest, most of us lately, feed room break-in motivated candidates might be the ones who are perhaps tending towards having higher insulin, the ponies. I know I own one. That's why I'm kind of smiling and chuckling about this because I swear he can open any, literally if it doesn't have a clip type latch on it, he will figure out how to open that door and he will stand there and work at it until he gets it open. And so... Obviously, there would be a risk for him going in and eating high starch, high sugar feeds that he's not supposed to if he already had high circulating insulin. One very large meal of a high starch type diet could be enough to really push him over the edge and put him into laminitis that way. So there's a couple of different ways they can get laminitis. But yeah, it's a big concern. And actually, it did happen to us. Not over horse feed. Strangely, he ate chicken food, which was superb. (laughs) That's a whole nother story. But it ended up in a vet visit and his stomach being pumped and activated charcoal and lots of hoof icing for three days as a caution. And thankfully, he was none the worse for wear and totally fine. But yeah, getting into the feed room and eating things they're not supposed to is a big worry. Yeah. And so I'm just going to jump in here with a little explanation for those who might not be familiar with laminitis. So this is a very, very brief, is that it's the inflammation of the lamini inside the hoof. We'll hear these horses referred to as having foundered because the coffin bone within their foot, the bone within the hoof capsule has rotated because that lamini has become compromised. So that's kind of the very short version. And there's lots of roads that lead there, like you mentioned, Claire, through too much grass, Gorging on feed also mares that retain their placentas during foaling can also. So lots of different reasons. Horses that stand that are weight-bearing, non-weight-bearing on all legs can have laminitis on other legs when they're recovering from surgery. So lots of different causes for that. But we don't want one of those causes to be horses getting into our feet. So we need to keep our feed bins. Just to back up, it's not even just, you know, having like a secure door, hopefully into your feed room, but actually having those individual, like if you've got your feed in cans, For our pony, he would just take the lid off of a trash can. Like I have bungee cords that go, you know, from the handle of the can through the lid handle, wrap around at a tight, like he would really have to work hard to get that lid off. So it's really actually really securing the lids on things as well as hopefully having a door on your feed room. Yeah. And for me, I use clips that the horses would not be able to unclip. And so I have big plastic bins that lock and that clip them shut. And I make sure actually they twist so the actual latch twists and then I clip that. So it's a double protection. Once they get thumbs, we're in the whole world of trouble once they develop thumbs. I know, right. (laughs) (laughs) And then the other thing that happens when our feed isn't stored correctly is that it can spoil or mold. And so moldy hay especially can lead to things like colic in our horses. That's a concern. So that's another reason that this is an important topic for us to talk about. Can you tell us how a horse owner can tell if their feed has gone rancid? And what does rancid mean? Yeah, normally it means that the fat has oxidized and sort of decomposed in a way that is no longer healthy and can actually have some sort of negative health consequences. Generally, when I'm thinking about rancidity, I'm thinking of products that are pretty high in fat. Unsaturated fats in particular are not particularly stable. And so those are the ones that are most likely to go rancid. So those are things like when we think about omega-6 and omega-3 fats, those are the ones that people are probably familiar hearing of that tend to go rancid. But I think that smell is a good indicator of rancidity. And to me, I think things that have gone rancid smell kind of sharp. I don't know how they smell to you, Michelle. Yeah, I can think of one time 
I went to Costco and I bought a big thing of walnuts thinking that I'm going to get my healthy fats from these walnuts that I don't even like eating. I put them in the fridge and then, you know, ate some and then left them there and then went to clean out the fridge and smelled them. And it's this obvious smell Uh that they are not good. Another thing that goes rancid that people who wear lipstick might be familiar with is the oils and lipstick sometimes go rancid. And so you go to put on your lipstick or your lip gloss and you'll have that like ick yeah. <laughs> smell. And I've definitely smelled that in the feed that has spilled out in my bins that has been in there and I should vacuum it out. Maybe I didn't get to that. And then it's been warm out. It goes rancid. And then my feed bins, the whole thing smells rancid. Fortunately, that's not all of my feed that's rancid. Right. I keep it in the bags in those, but the loose stuff. So keep that in mind as you're feeding look for that smell. That's a good reason to keep your feed in the bags in the grain bin, to be honest, which is actually my preferred thing to do because I'm lazy and I don't like cleaning out feed bins and cleaning out trash cans yeah. is a really annoying job. So I actually don't pour the feed into the can. I keep it in the bag inside the can. And so that's one reason I do that. The other reason I do that is that I also then always have the bag. If there's ever a recall, I have all the information associated with that bag right until the end of the bag is finished because companies, when they do recalls, will say, feed manufactured at this mill with this code. And the code is typically stamped on the seam of the bag, like on the bottom paper seam. When you go to your bag, into your trash can and then throw the bag away, there's a recall. You know, I've had that happen. I've had clients kind of go, oh my gosh, I don't know. I hear there's a recall. I don't know if my food came from that mill or not. I don't have the bag anymore. So if you are someone that throws the bag away, at least photograph the barcode and the manufacture date and location code that's on that seam. So you have it on your phone. So you have some kind of recourse or ability to know if you're affected by that recall or not. Mentioning that label, is anything on that label saying the sell-by date of horse feed? Is there a date that it should be sold by? When you go to the grocery store and you buy your gallon of milk and it says it needs to be used by whatever date, does the same apply? That's a great question. Yeah. It generally doesn't have a best buy date on it. Some supplements do. Some of the supplement companies do put best before dates on their packaging. Feed companies will tend to put a manufacture date, although it's sometimes a Julian date, which is kind of a weird, that's like the day and the year it was manufactured. So it'll have like 273 or something, 2023273 or something, which is like the 273rd day of 2023. It does look like a bunch of numbers, but it does actually mean something. And then it might be like a three-digit letter code or something that corresponds to that company's, that particular mill that it was made at. Generally, we want to use feed within about three months of manufacture. Pellets tend to last a little longer than textured feed. So pellets maybe could go six months. Although, honestly, I think if you're feeding most feeds properly, you're going to get rid of them before that, unless you're somebody who goes and buys a pallet of feed and then it's sitting around for a long time because you don't quite have enough horses to get through that in that time scale. So generally, my recommendation is three months from date of manufacture, regardless of whether it's textured or pelleted. It's worth checking your bags sometimes because I've definitely, I used to take students on a field trip to a local feed store. Occasionally, you'd find some bags back there that had been put in a corner and they'd been there a while. Yeah, I one time I was feeding a very specific feed that was hard to find for a very specific reason. And I happened to look at the code. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what exactly it meant. But when I got the same feed like nine months later, I knew enough to know that the label, it was very close to what I had previously fed. And I then looked it up. I was able to search online and I did find that that particular bag of feed had probably been sitting on the shelves at that feed store for maybe over two years, (laughs) if I remember correctly. Yeah. So if the bags come out kind of dusty or dirty looking, it's definitely worth checking that date. I mean, most of the time, you know, they're going to get shipped on a pallet and plastic wrapped. So they'll be pretty clean when they get to the feed store. And so they'll look shiny and clean when you pick them up and buy them. But they've been sitting out back because it's not a very popular feed and it's been sitting back there a while. They're more likely to be dusty and what have you. So check the dates on them. So once you open a bag of feed, how quickly do you need to feed it? Is it like my cornflakes and I open them and they're going to go bad once the bag is opened? No, I mean, feed bags are not airtight anyway. I mean, air will move through them sometimes. Depends on the kind of bag that's being used, but I don't worry about that. And again, that's the three-month thing once you've opened it. 
just use it within that time frame. We talked a little bit about storing the feed for our horses' safety to keep our horses out of it. When it comes to storing feed or supplements, do you have any recommendations for storage that helps protect the product that's inside the container or the bag? For example, maybe put the lid back on the supplement <laughs> to keep yeah. the dust and dirt out of it and the rodents. Yeah, I definitely work into feed rooms where, I mean, let's be honest, some of that supplement packaging is not easy to open and close. Those plastic lids, like you feel like you're going to cut your fingertips off trying to get the lids off. And so the sort of temptation is to sort of haphazardly rest them on the top but not really snap them on. I've definitely been guilty with that occasionally. But yeah, ideally, you're popping that on a little more tightly than that. And so some of the manufacturers have buckets that have the spin lids. Those are really nice. All the folding lids that kind of fold up and down. And so you're not trying to like peel it. I always feel like you're trying to wrestle the container as you're like, get this bit off. Then you have to turn it and get another bit. And then the first bit is reconnected or something. So I get it. It's a pain. But yeah, ideally, you do put the lids back on. I think also getting those lids on is really important to keep those rodents out. Mm -hmm. If they can access it easily, you're more likely to attract them into your barn and your feed room. Some of them can fit through a space as small as a dime. So even if it's like closed, they can still squeeze in. That's something to keep in mind as well. Ants too. We deal with ants. So when you don't put lids on things, especially anything that has a little bit of sugar in it, like some of that electrolytes and things have a little bit in or some of those molasses pellets, apple, whatever, the ants, you'll suddenly be like, oh, hello, where have you come from? Trail. Yeah. <laughs> and then in your feed room, as far as the rodent prevention, it's sweeping up when you're done, mm-hmm. making sure there aren't any little loose bits that are extra treats for those critters that might find their way into your feed room. It's hard because right. all of the tasty things are in our barns. We aren't there, whether or not you have barn cats. You might see it a buffet for the <laughs> rodents if you're not tidying up afterwards. I do tend to find that rodent issues can be a little seasonal. So as we're heading now into fall a little more and harvests are going on, you know, I know like corn harvest and things is going on. And so anything that's been living out in those cornfields is suddenly kind of going, oh, we need somewhere else to live. Or it started raining and it's not quite so pleasant to be outside. You know, food is not so easy to come by outside. So they start moving into drier, warmer, easier meal locations. And so I always feel like this is the time of year where you might see more rodents in feed rooms as they start moving back indoors a little bit. It's a great time of year to do that autumn cleaning and kind of spend the Saturday afternoon or whatever, like really take everything out of the feed room, sweep everything, wipe the shelves off and what have you before it gets too cold that you don't want to take your gloves off to do that kind of thing. Get the shop back out. Exactly. Back in all the corners too. So let's go ahead and talk about storing hay. I mentioned moldy hay. We don't want that. We don't want to be feeding that to our horses. Also, just hay is so expensive. You don't want to waste your hay by not storing it correctly. Are there any other reasons that it's important to think about how you store your hay? Yeah, I mean, if you don't store it correctly with some air circulation around it, especially if you buy it off the field, it can sort of sweat and start to mold as well. And I've definitely seen that. So you want to stack it so the air can flow around it. I also think it's just important to stack it correctly just from a safety standpoint. I mean, we got full squeezes of hay come in and we feed on a weekend evening. And when I'm going up a ladder 15 feet, up on top of a squeeze of hay to push hay bales down. There are the occasional squeezes that come in where I'm like, it doesn't look brilliantly stacked together. You know, and they come out of the field that way because they literally pick them up off the field and put them in the squeeze, right? And deliver them as a squeeze. And sometimes, especially if you end up with what was a partial squeeze, you know, so the like bottom stack came off one field and then they went to a different, it's like it doesn't quite interlock the same. So making sure things are stacked properly, it is a safety issue too. If you're going to be up on top of that to get the hay down later in the winter, you want it to be stable. Yeah. When you're stacking your hay too, if you're not getting squeezed delivered like that, you do have to think about like how the bales are going to come down so that you can climb your stack. Yes. So you don't have to get a ladder all the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And sometimes I look at it and I go, I'm just too for climbing up here but you do what you have to do (laughs) yeah I definitely feel more comfortable when there's somebody to hold the ladder versus when I'm up it on my own it's not that going up it's coming down that always worries me it's stepping onto the ladder that's 15 feet high that's going to shift underneath me yeah and then obviously as I mentioned before the airflow around you don't want to stack those bales tight against the wall 
or straight onto concrete because if they are at all damp, if there's any moisture in them, concrete's strange substance. It sort of, you know, absorbs moisture and it kind of holds damp sometimes. So especially if it's not like sealed and so things can get kind of moldy. So I think people traditionally think of storing hay on pallets to keep it off the ground. There's pros and cons there though too, which I think you found, right? Yeah. So the pallets, because I use pallets, one, to keep airflow also for if we get rain or moisture, you know, melt off after it snows, you get that water moving and lifting the hay up. That couple inches keeps the moisture, the water from running into your bottom layer of hay. Also, that's where our local pack rats like to nest. (laughs) (laughs) Under the bales, that is where Mrs. Pack Rat had her babies, which we found when we were moving hay around for the new load to come in. So yeah, I mean, it's pros and cons. Also, the pallets can be difficult when you're stacking hay. You know, they'll break. You have to not step in between them, twist an ankle while you're stacking. Those are things to keep in mind. But for me, it is the best of the not great solutions that I have. So I have to ask for those listeners like me, what is a pack rat? Oh, (laughs) the pack rats. So pack rats are very, very cute. They're like these large rodents that, well, they aren't like, they are large (laughs) rodents. And they're called pack rats because they steal all of your stuff. And a friend of mine who moved here, she didn't totally believe me that pack rats were stealing things. And then she found a pack rat nest in her barn and she found old tubes of banamine that she left oh, laying wow. around. She found sunglasses. I wear gloves a lot, like gardening gloves when I'm working in the barn. And I often will take off my right gloves so I can do stuff with my right hand. I'll set down the gloves. And then I'm like, where have all my right gloves gone? They've usually gone to a pack rat nest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they steal those. And they'll trade. They do these goofy things where they'll take something and then they'll leave like a pellet or rock behind. You know, they're like, thank you for the glove. Here's a rock. <laughs> Not as useful. The hard part is they absolutely destroy anything they can get their teeth on. I've had them chew on saddles. Oh, yeah. I've had them get into my tack room. Now, the tack room is fortified, but I had one that got up on a nice Western saddle and it urinated on the saddle, which is something that they do. They pee all over everything and they make everything stink. So as cute as they are, they have to go. Also, alfalfa, they seem to really love my alfalfa hay and they will ruin bales of alfalfa because they will sit and eat and whatever they do huh. and poop and pee in my alfalfa bales, which is very sad because alfalfa here is very expensive. So we do have to Good dispatch to with the pack rats. Did not know that about pack rats. Yes, pack rats, they're cute, big eyes, big ears, fluffy tails, highly destructive. I am going to have to go find a picture of one after we're done here, I think. <laughs> yeah. You would think you could have one as a pet until you smelled what it does to your horse blankets. Mm, Lovely. That's another thing to get out at this time of year is all those things you've been storing just to make sure they haven't got any rodent friends before winter. Yes. And I will find pack rat nests with parts of horse blankets, alfalfa and horse grain and all sorts of stuff that they have stored away for the winter. So they are doing their job. Right. Unfortunately, it conflicts with my horse keeping. So we tidy up, clean up and then They do get under the pallets, but what can you do? So besides pallets, what do you recommend? I mean, I've kept hay on old hay before or straw, like actually like broken a bale of straw on the ground and put it on that. And the straw, I think, is actually better than hay because straw has larger stems and they're stronger. So they tend to kind of hold air in them, you know, kind of thing. And so they kind of create this sort of less compressed, there's a little bit of air that can move through the straw. So I've definitely done that before. Those are other options. Yeah, I do just be careful walking across pallets. I know I put my foot through a pallet before and it's not a fun thing and they've got nails in them and let's just be careful. Yeah, they can definitely do an ankle. A lot of people don't actually even have a hay barn and so they're storing their hay outside and maybe have it topped. And I think it's worth investigating how to top properly because the temptation is just to throw a top over it and kind of stake it down. But actually you don't want the top of the top to be flat. You want it to have a pitch and kind of think of it like a roof so that if you do get snow, it just slides off or rain just runs off and you don't have it sitting on the top of the top. And obviously you need to make sure that your tops don't have any holes in. And if you do stake or rope your tops that in the dark, you're not going to fall over your rope that you've staked your top with. Your trip line. I've never done that on hay. I've certainly done it on a tent in the middle of the night and that's not fun either. So with the dark nights coming, if you're going to use a tarp and stake it down, make sure you have some way of being able to see the ropes on it and things stakes on the ground easily so you don't hurt yourself. I'm really fortunate that I now have 
hay storage. We built a hay shelter several years ago, but for a long time I did have to tarp, which is just like sometimes you have to do what you have to do. It wasn't ideal, but I will definitely point out that you want a really high quality tarp too. Yes. So when you're buying the tarp, it's worth it to spend the extra money on a higher quality one. It's going to last longer and it's going to protect your hay. And what you would otherwise lose in hay if it gets wet would outweigh the cost of spending extra money on a nicer tarp that's going to last. That's a good point. Some things to keep in mind. If you are someone who has to tarp hay, I feel you. And climb under the tarp to get the hay. I've been there. Oh, yeah. The other thing, too, is is if you don't have a purpose hay barn and you get a choice of where to put your hay, if you're going to top, you know, just think about the lay of the land and how water moves around your property and mud and that kind of thing. And try to think about where you're going to keep that hay so that it's least likely to get damaged by water runoff or those kinds of things. And it is going to become a high traffic area because you are going to be going back to it multiple times per day. So what kind of footing do you have outside of that area? Because again, I've seen a lot of hay sort of set on what started off as pretty hard ground and then by the middle of January is ankle deep in mud and you're losing hay just in the mud as you take it out. You don't have anywhere good to put the open bale of hay to fill your hay nets and that kind of thing. So whether it's gravel or you know whatever you choose, just, just think about that kind of side of it as well. So when you're storing your hay, sometimes we do end up with sun exposure on our hay. My hay storage is three-sided, not four. Is there any risk to sun exposure on our hay? Yes and no. I mean, yes, you're going to the outside edges are going to fade. And I think people are always concerned that it greatly affects the nutritional value. But the reality is, is when you open those bales, they should be nice and green and the color you'd expect them to be once you've opened the bale on the inside that is just that surface that was exposed to UV light that has changed color. Hay loses some level of nutritional value, whether it's in the sun or not, but mostly what it's losing are vitamins. So it's losing, you know, vitamin E, vitamin A, beta carotene rather, is decreasing over time. Most of the minerals, they're going to stay pretty steady over time. They don't change a whole lot, but yeah, your beta carotene and your vitamin E is going to decrease actually quite rapidly month to month over time. And that's one reason why even if you're relying on basically have an all forage diet, you do need to have some sort of ration balancer or some source of those vitamins in your horse's diet to kind of make up for that loss. But really, it's not a big deal. Just having those outsides of those bales being bleached overall, the majority of the hay in the bale is just fine. So let's see if I can sum up what we've talked about on feed and hay storage. So we talked about keeping our feed Stored in a way that horses can't access it because it can be dangerous to the horses. Also stored in a way that rodents can't access it. Otherwise, the rodents will move in because there's lots to eat and they will have the shiniest, they will be the healthiest rats you've ever seen when they eat your good feed. We also want to look at the labels and keep our labels so that if something happens, our feed gets recalled, we know which mill our feed came from. Any other on the bag feed and supplement storage that I missed? I would just say, and it just came into my mind, some people like to use those old chest freezers for feed storage, and they do make great feed storage containers. Being a lot of bonds with children, often small children, please make sure you break the latches on them. Feed bins and things can become potentials for hide-and-seek locations, and there have been some really sad stories of children climbing inside of old chest freezers to play hide and seek and you cannot open them once you're in them and the top is shut because they have a latch that doesn't open unless you press the button on the outside. And because they're so heavily insulated, you can't hear anything. It's a rather sad thing to say, but it's important that they do make great feed storage because they are so insulated, almost climate controlled and they're perfect. I mean, they're rectangular and you can put multiple bags of feed standing up in them and the lid comes down, they're rodent proof, da 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 But just make sure you break the latch so that you can open them from the inside when the lid is down. Yeah. Once that latch is broken, they aren't necessarily horse proof. That's true. So, so something else to consider if you have them, if that's not in a storage room with a door, it may not provide what you need for keeping horses out of it. I'm pretty sure my horse could figure out how to open a refrigerator if their feed was in a refrigerator, though. (laughs) (laughs) And then we talked about hay storage. So it's keeping it from getting moist, keeping the rain and snow off of it, and also making sure that it is up on something so that you don't get the moisture from underneath. But be careful with those pallets. 
they might be the best thing that you have. And then we touched on losing some nutrition to sun exposure. Not a huge deal, but something that can happen if they're exposed. Yeah, and make sure those bales are stacked so the air can move around them. Well, that is all the time we have (laughs) to talk about feed. Can you hear that I have a writing lesson in about 30 minutes? (laughs) Well, I hope you might just sort out your pack rat issue and that you can persuade them. Maybe a gift of a ticket to go live somewhere else. (laughs) They don't. (laughs) They just come back. (laughs) There is always more where the first two came from. Yes, that is the sad thing about um, rodents is once you've got like what one or two, there's never just one or two. Yep. And sometimes it's just part of living out in the country with lots of food for them and neighbors with food for them. If you have chickens, chicken feed, rodents love chicken feed. It's hard to keep them out of chicken feeder. So it's an ongoing challenge. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and close our episode. For our listeners, if you would like to be part of our conversation, please send your suggestions for future topics and your equine nutrition questions to info at scoopandscale.com. That's scoop and spelled out A-N-D scale.com. You can also find Claire at clarityequinenutrition.com. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Share us on all your social media platforms. It means a lot to us. We're loving the fact that our audience is growing. Yes, we appreciate you spending time with us and listening to our episodes and sending your feedback. So thank you for the Scoop and Scale podcast. I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. 